Okay, um, so um, I think a lot of the talks have set the scene, so what I hope to do is talk about some of the challenges and potential solutions around marine monitoring. And here are the credits, because um, though I'm from the National Oceanography Centre, there is a lot of work going around at the moment looking at um, what might happen if you had CCS leakage uh, and how do we actually go about doing that. So the bottom half of the uh, slide shows a lot of uh, institutes that we're working with and then the top uh, shows a number of large EU and UK projects that are dealing around the issue of ecosystem impact and how we would go around monitoring CCS if it leaks uh, through the sea floor. So I want to talk briefly around CCS impact research. I'll briefly um, talk about site characteristics and monitoring rationale, and that builds on um, some of the discussion uh, earlier this morning. I'll talk briefly around leakage scenarios and the te temporal sequence of emission, or potential se temporal sequence. I'll give an overview of what I think is the state of art where we are with chemical um, and sonar sensors that could be applied to CCS monitoring. I'll also do the same for underwater platforms. We've got our sensors, but how are we going to deploy them through the water column or on the sea floor? So I'll describe the state of art for that. I'll talk about how we might actually determine or quantify volumes uh, of leakage. Uh, and I will offer a vision, not the vision, but a vision of how we might detect CCS leakage in the North Sea, which is obviously of uh, importance to the UK. I'll address this issue around quantifying CO2 loss, and this is trying to move beyond just detection. Can we actually quantify volume? And hopefully um, I can convince you of some conclusions at the end. So we've seen this slide before, um, and I think the point I would like to make is if we want to get to here, then these two uh, issues around leakage impact and assurance monitoring are uh, important. And they're not actually unrelated, because a lot of the work that we're beginning to do now around leakage impact, uh, we're beginning to understand the processes of uh, CO2 uh, leakage on the seafloor that can then feed into what parameters are uh, easily uh, monitor, uh, measured on the seafloor, uh, which can be the basis of a monitoring program. So there are four critical issues that are being uh, addressed in a number of programs around what happens, hopefully it doesn't, but if uh, we had CO2 leaking on the seafloor. So one of the first issues is what is the conduits of uh, CO2 or associated fluids that are going to come from the reservoir to the seafloor. What are the pathways of that fluid uh, that are going to control that leakage? Then what happens at the seafloor? How does CO2 actually flux through the seafloor? Third question is what happens once it gets into the water column? Is it always going to stay as a CO2 bubble? Is it going to dissolve into the water column as it ascends through 80 metres of the North Sea? And the fourth main question is, what is the impact of the ecosystem? And uh, probably most importantly, what is happening to the uh, benthos, the animal life, on the sea floor? So all of that research feeds into what are the critical parameters that we can potentially monitor on the sea floor? And this is being addressed in a number of different ways. Uh, here are a number of uh, study sites. The uh, ECO2, which is a large EU project, is um, spending a lot of time and effort looking at Snowvit and Sleipner. Uh, and I will be leading a cruise uh, this year to Sleipner, where we'll be doing a lot of work around the Sleipner field, looking at um, the seafloor using AUVs and trying to detect um, fluid ex uh, expulsion. We know um, at Sleipner there is some leakage from some abandoned wells. So there's some work that we're doing there. On the right, there's been a lot of work being uh, going to natural CO2 uh, analog uh, seep sites where uh, equipment techniques are being developed. And on the left is um, a novel experiment that starts next week in uh, Scotland 
where a consortium of UK uh, research institutes have drilled something like 300 metres from shore out beneath a Scottish lock and we're going to release CO2 for a period of 30 days uh, through about uh, 15 metres of sediment and then into the water column. And what we're trying to do there is understand the buffering effects of uh, seafloor sediments on CO2 before it gets to the seafloor. And then um, also beginning to deploy different monitoring techniques in that very controlled environment where it's cheap, we're using scuba divers, we're not using ships and uh, ROVs. So... Um, storage sites. If we look at the North Sea, potentially, and uh, uh, this was shown, uh, I guess, earlier this morning, was essentially there are going to be two types of storage in the North Sea. On the left, you can have depleted uh, hydrocarbon reservoirs. Typically, those reservoirs are going to have something like 250 square kilometres of seafloor. If you multiply that by 80 to 100 metres of the water depth of the uh, North Sea, then you're talking about 25 to 30 kilometres cubic kilometres of ocean that you may actually uh, need to monitor or uh, survey in some way. Uh, and if you're talking about uh, depleted hydrocarbon reservoirs, then there is the uh, suggestion that point sources may in fact be more likely as uh, leakage sites than dispersed seeps. If we go to the other extreme or the other uh, in member, we're talking about saline aquifers, far larger in scale, at least one order of magnitude uh, greater in sea floor, greater magnitude of um, volume of ocean, and uh, they haven't been punctured by wells. Uh, and th the argument could be that point uh, and dispersed uh, seep sources are equally likely. So the issue then is how do we monitor uh, sites with that area, that um, volume of ocean, where we might have potentially known and unknown point and disperse seep sites. It's a pretty tough thing to try and tackle. And again, it's a point that was made this morning, there might be three rationale for why you want to do uh, marine monitoring. Obviously there's baseline monitoring prior to injection, seafloor and ocean detection, uh, and then the issue of quantification. If CO2 is coming out of these stores, where is the best place to quantify that leakage? And hopefully I can um, demonstrate to you that the seafloor is probably uh, the more tractable place to solve that question. And again, uh, we're back to the point source. We might have a range of discharges that are point source, high discharge, right through to uh, dispersed uh, seeps, and they are low discharge um, leakages. So let's uh, look at potentially uh, the North Sea uh, and let's for the moment just ignore the text on the right because I want to talk you through this, um, so this profile through the sea floor. Um, we know from the North Sea that obviously the sediments are stratified, there is a sequence of sediments, we have a storage reservoir here, we have some form of seal, then we have an overlying sequence of sediments. Um, and then near the seafloor, we'll have some unconsolidated sediments. So that's fine. That there is a stratigraphy there of rock layers. There's also a stratigraphy of formation fluids, though, in those sediments. So conceivably, with our C CCS storage site, we have CO2 in the store. We may well have other formation fluids in the overlying sediments. And certainly in the uppermost sediments... This upper 30 to 50 metres of sediments, which are uncemented, unlithified, un unconsolidated, they will have reducing uh, pore fluids in them. So the argument is if we are going to have leakage, and let's assume that we have a fault as the conduit for getting uh, CO2 out of the store, the first thing out of the store is not going to be CO2. We would uh, hypothesise that there are, in fact, going to be precursory fluids that are going to come out of these uh, CO2 stores if they, if they leak. So the sequence is that uh, CO2 is going to leak from the store. That's going to buoyantly rise. That is going to buoyantly drive whatever fluids are in this overlying sediments. And they are, in turn, going to buoyantly drive these pore, reducing pore fluids in the uppermost sediments. 
So the sequence might be that you have anoxic fluids coming out first, you might have a saline fluid that's sourced from this area second, and you might finally have CO2 uh, coming out last. So there might be indications of some precursory fluids. Um, and I think the other point I would make is that it is more tractable to uh, establish the, uh, the flux of CO2 out of these store sites at the sea floor than down here. Down here you're going to have to invert a lot of uh, geophysics, uh, whether it be seismic velocities, uh, electrical resistivity, whatever it might be, there is going to be some inversion, some assumptions are going to be, have to be made in uh, calculating any loss. Whereas at the seafloor, you can actually directly measure it. So it's a more tractable uh, boundary from which to make your measurement. So how do we actually detect um, these things? In the North Sea at those depths, you may well have, uh, if there is CO2 loss, it may well be coming out as a gas phase and as a dissolved phase. So gas phase, we can use physical techniques, and there is work around passive and active acoustic bubble detection that uh, would determine free gas, gas bubbles. Uh, we know that we can uh, use hydrophones that detect bubble oscillation and expansion, while active sonar systems will record backscattering from gas bubbles. And recently, we're now um, beginning to understand if we can do that across a number of sonar frequencies, we can actually invert that data to get the bubble size uh, population. So not, not only can we detect the bubbles, we can potentially, in fact, work out the volume of gas in, that bubbles, in those bubbles, though the bubbles may, in fact, uh, go over a range of sizes. If we're talking about chemical detection, we're talking about the dissolve phase. Uh, here we're talking about chemical techniques that are going to measure, uh, obviously, increase uh, acidity, the decrease in pH, uh, dissolve uh, manganese, iron, all of those things that are going to be unique um, identifiers of uh, fluids that are going to uh, coming out of the seafloor. So the signature of these fluids is actually quite unique. So for the reduced uh, unconsolidated sediment poor fluids, these are ones that are going to come out first. Uh, you might have increases in dissolved iron, an increase in H2S, a de decrease in uh, uh, oxidation, EH. Reservoir fluids, formation fluids, are again going to have uh, different uh, chemical signatures. And then for the actual CO2, we can talk about an increase in CO2, decrease in pH uh, units, and a decrease in alkalinity. All of those things we can measure at the seafloor, or soon we'll be able to. So uh, just to uh, indicate the, uh, the sequence of those uh, coming out in, in that previous slide. So what, what is the, um, the detection limit that we can now measure some of these uh, features? Well, we can measure dissolved iron down to nanomolar uh, limits. We can currently measure pH down to 0.005, and I would predict within one or two years we can get another order of magnitude. So we, with a pH, we will be probably able to measure down to 0.0005 of a pH unit. That is quite sensitive detection of a change in pH. Salinity, we've done that um, to high resolution for a long time. Temperature, we can go to three decimal places. And CO2 as a dissolved phase, in principle, in one or two years' time, we can measure down to one part per million. So that's the equivalent of one microatmosphere. Those are low, um, relatively low um, levels of CO2. How, do, how are we doing this? Well, there's a number of techniques. The first is around a technique called microfluidics, which is essentially you take your chemistry lab and you put it onto a microchip. So you do all of your reagent chemistry that you do in a flume cupboard in a chemistry lab, you put it all on a chip that's no bigger than this. Um, and we've developed these, uh, and there are a lot of groups working on this. And essentially we have... Um, a pH sensor that is no more uh, than the size of my uh, hand, and we can get down to uh, currently uh, 0.007, and as I said earlier, we will get down to 0.005 uh, 
uh, in the near future. Uh, we believe also that we can uh, convert this into a CO2 sensor, which will give you the resolution that I talked about earlier. So that is one technique using microfluidics. Uh, and these are designed to last for at least one to two years, low cost, no, need no uh, further uh, interference or uh, communication, uh, and they are corrected for uh, pressure and temperature at the seafloor. So we've taken account for all of those uh, effects. Another technique is using optodes where we have uh, fluorescence of a foil, uh, and that foil is constructed in such a way that it is sensitive to pH or CO2, uh, and again, um, it is built uh, for long-term uh, sensing developments. And here is a pH um, opto uh, sensor. Same thing for CO2. Again, uh, a different foil on an optode. We're fluorescing uh, that optode. The foil responds to different concentrations of CO2. Um, and we've got this uh, sensor to a technology readiness level of 3. So things are developing around CO2 sensors and pH sensors. There is also another technique where we have solid state sensors where essentially you uh, create a synthetic polymer. In this case it's a methane sensor. Uh, methane um, diffuses into this polymer uh, and depending on the different concentration of methane the polymer changes its refractive index and the refractive index is a direct measurement of the amount of methane that's diffusing into that polymer. Again, designed for long-term uh, deployment um, at relatively low cost. And we're again thinking about using that uh, technique for uh, CO2. So that's another potential way of dealing with this question of CO2 sensing. So we've got our sensors, well we're near to having our sensors, how are we going to deploy um, this, uh, these sensors to the seafloor? Well there's potentially two ways of doing that, the first is um, using uh, autonomous underwater vehicles, AUVs, uh, currently these uh, typically have deployments for uh, one or two de days. Uh, depending on how much uh, equipment you have on them and whether you're actively driving uh, sensors, that is a typical deployment is two days. Uh, and we also have deployments for seafloor landers. So if we detect a leak and we want to quantify bubbles, as an example, we can have now seafloor landers that can be deployed up for um, a year in length. Uh, and here is a, a, a lander that has been deployed uh, in the Arctic in October 2010. Uh, we recover it in 2011 and it's still sitting there in 2012. And in fact, this particular lander will be deployed this coming summer at Sleipner for a year. So we'll have a range of uh, sensors on there measuring the physical properties of the water column and the chemical properties of uh, the waters around Sleipner. Uh, and this is the lander also that uh, may well be used in a yet-to-be-decided EU project um, and may well be um, deployed at GoldenEye for a year as well as a large uh, EU project. So we are developing ways of putting sensors on the seafloor or deploying them uh, through the water column. And a new uh, development that we're working on is long-range AUVs. So I talked about AUVs that can only uh, last for two days because of battery life. Here is a new a AUV that is um, halfway through a series of trials um, and that will be operational in about six months. And that AUV will allow uh, 6,000 kilometres of uh, track or six-month deployment. So tip, this is potentially a way of actually monitoring a storage site uh, by going out once at the beginning of six months and picking this instrument up at, at the end of six months. This will do its own thing for six months without any um, ship requirements. It will have all of its own navigation uh, and intelligence about making decisions. It can, it's even capable of sitting on the seafloor for two months, waking itself up and then carrying on um, doing some other work. So that will be operational uh, in about six months' time. 
So, I've talked about um, sensors. Are we actually marrying these two things together? Um, and the short answer is yes. So, here is uh, the pH sensor, which we have uh, at 0 0.005 at near sea uh, level. And here you can see a track of uh, surface pH differences around the UK uh, based on a ship survey. So, here is a high resolution uh, pH uh, sensor uh, being deployed on a ship. Uh, I've already talked about the lander. Here is uh, an example of 10 months of data from this lander where we can measure a whole range of different parameters, physical properties uh, and chemical sensors um, on the seafloor next to any uh, known leak. Uh, and the next stage is to put uh, sonar systems into that lander so that we can actually image bubbles. And here is another example where we have used an AUV, and in this case we have detected a hydrothermal plume uh, with uh, an AUV survey, and we're using an EH sensor in this case to detect a hydrothermal plume coming out of the seafloor. And that um, is an example of the marrying up of an AUV and a chemical sensor. I have talked already about um, active and passive uh, sonar systems. Obviously, you can put um, those active and passive sonar systems onto ships. You can potentially put them into AUVs, and that is something that we're looking at at the moment, is putting uh, passive um, sonar acquisition into an AUV. And you can deploy a whole series of instruments on the seafloor around seep sites or on your pipe network to detect uh, bubbles. Um, and things have evolved in the last six months in this field, actually, because what we can now demonstrated is that we can actually invert uh, multi-frequency echo sounder data into bubble size populations. Uh, and here's an example from uh, the Arctic. This is not CO2, this is methane, but the principle still holds, where we have a, a, a bubble plume uh, which is acoustically imaged at 38 kilohertz, uh, and is the same bubble plume is imaged at 120 kilohertz. So if we could have a multi-frequency um, echo sounder looking at that particular uh, bubble plume, then potentially we can actually measure the whole range of bubble sizes and invert the bubble size population. If we know the ascent rate of the bubbles, we can work out a flux rate. We can work out... Uh, the flux rate of gas bubbles um, coming off the seafloor. So what can we detect? Well, one way of uh, working this through is um, looking at what the chemistry would be inside a hydrodynamic model. So the, the issue, what I'm trying to do here is uh, demonstrate what can we detect um, at the moment. So if we look at this three-coordinate uh, diagram, if we assume that there is a CO2 leak at the origin here, and we have flux rate as a uh, log scale going in this direction um, in litres per day, and then we have a distance from the source in kilometres going from 0.001 out to some other distance in log scale. If we have, um, we could, using this diagram, we could actually work out the the change in pH depending on the flux rate and the distance from the source. So this is a theoretical model of what the pH would do depending on differences of the flux rate uh, and different distances away from that uh, leak, and this is a concentration of pH. And currently we've got pH sensors down here, so potentially we can actually measure uh, a sizable uh, fraction of any detection. And the trick here is to embed um, reactive carbonate chemistry. CO2 is a, obviously a very reactive uh, compound, and we can uh, immerse that into a hydrodynamic model and work out the dispersion and mixing of that um, pH. We do the same thing for CO2, we can do the same thing for dissolved in, in organics, and we can do the same thing for sound. How far away do we, from a bubble um, do we have to be at a known flux rate before we can detect it on a scale of decibels? It's a, we, can, we can work that out. We haven't yet, but we can. So, using that sort of um, uh, 
modelling, you could say that uh, we need, if we want to detect uh, 10 litres per day, we need to be within one kilometre of a leak. So using this forward modelling, we could then work out the line spacing that we would need for an AUV survey. We take our AUV, which is deployed for six months, and depending on the answers from here, we could have a line spacing of 200 metres apart for our AUV survey, and after six months, you would actually cover a significant area of a seafloor, detecting changes in pH, detecting changes in CO2, or detecting changes in uh, decibels. If, on the other hand, you said uh, on the basis of this modelling that we could actually uh, widen our spacing out to a kilometre of AU, AUV uh, track separation, then obviously you get a far larger area mapped. The point I'm trying to make here is the scales that I talked about at the beginning, are, yes they are large, but here is a way of potentially mapping large areas of a seafloor and lowermost, lowermost parts of the water column to detect chemically uh, dissolved uh, CO2 and to acoustically detect uh, gas um, as uh, CO2. So, the conclusions. CCS sites with large spatial seafloor extent and overlying ocean volumes um, provide a monitoring challenge. We've, we, we've heard this uh, repeatedly during the day. Um, you may well want to monitor for baseline studies, leakage detection and flux emission quantification. We've heard all of the rationale for those. Um, CO2 leakage may have some precursory fluids. It may not be CO2 that comes out of these things first. Uh, and those precursory fluids do have uh, unique chemical signatures. Uh, marine sensors and underwater platform technology is developing. Um, to deploy long-term point observing and remotely surveyed monitoring of critical uh, fluid parameters, uh, but we're not there yet. We're close, but not there yet. Um, C4 and ocean monitoring can detect both dissolved phase and gas phase. We can do the former using chemistry, and we can do the latter using either passive or active sonar. But again, um, that is not yet commercially deployable, but uh, again, we are close. And both, both the chemistry and uh, sonar systems potentially uh, provide a way of uh, quantifying beyond just leakage. So we can, not only can we uh, potentially de detect leakage, we may well be able to uh, quantify the leakage. Um, and the final point is I would suggest that the seafloor is probably the easier place uh, to determine CO2 loss uh, than uh, deeper uh, beneath the seafloor. Thank you.